Again, welcome to Freedom. I'm so glad to see you here today, and let me say to those of you who are joining us online, thank you for tuning in. We, uh, we love the fact that you get to participate in what God's doing here, even if you're far, far away, so thank you for doing that. Uh, we are uh, in a series right now uh, entitled Things Jesus Never Said, and we're going to be in John chapter 16. If you've got your Bibles and want to go ahead and turn there, we'll be in the 16th chapter of John. It has been my experience, and I wonder if maybe you've sort of seen the same thing too. The longer that I have lived, um, I, I found it kind of a surprising thing to recognize this. I guess it shouldn't have been, but I, I've realized the more people I have come across who have tried the Jesus thing and tried the church thing, and in their words, it just didn't work for them, and they've given up on it. H have you bumped into anybody that that's kind of their story? And I'm not saying it to put anybody down, it's just an observation that I, I have, have met more and more people along the way who it is their story and it seems like we've got a lot of them in the south where everybody's been to church for some portion of your life. You, I don't think you get to live here, you don't get a passport for the south if you don't go to church for some portion of your life, but they, they tried church and they tried Jesus and it just didn't work for them. And when you listen to their stories, a lot of times it, it sounds something like this, you know, I, I tried church, I, I went the Jesus route, but then things started happening in my life. Things were going wrong. I had problems in my marriage. I had problems with my kids. I had problems with my job. I, I lost my job. I got sick, or somebody that I cared about got sick, or they died, and, and the list just goes on and on. It starts to sound a little bit like a country song, doesn't it? You know, I, my girlfriend left me, my truck broke down, my dog got run over, and I spilled my beer, and you know, it's, life isn't good. It's, it's kind of that story, and so somehow this must not be working. Jesus isn't fixing those things for me, and so in frustration or doubt or confusion about God being good or God caring or God being real, a lot of people turn away and just decide this doesn't work or it doesn't work for me. So today's message is dedicated to anybody who's ever felt that way. It's focused on anybody who's ever felt like that. And I have a feeling that for a lot of us assembled in the room today and for probably a lot of people who are watching and listening online, that we have had some sense of that at some point along the way. That some bad things have happened some things that didn't make sense, some things that maybe created some real questions and doubt about the goodness of God or how much God really cares. And they may have left us at a place where, maybe for those of us who still are in church, that part of us believes the, the stuff that we've heard taught all of our lives and part of us feels a real disconnect from that or feels like it's not really working. And so today we're going to press into that, to the question of d does God really... Does he really care, and is, is God really promising that what he wants for us all the time is just good days and good times and blessings and, and constant protection? And so, as we've done each week, uh, just on a little bit of a lighthearted side, we're going to start with some things that Jesus never said about what we're talking about today. Again, uh, the reason we're doing the things Jesus never said is because we understand that the, the words in red in the Bible, the words of Jesus, are so powerful, so profound but so many times you will better understand the things that Jesus said when you also take into account what Jesus did not say on the same subject. So three or four things that Jesus did not say about what we're going to talk about today. For starters, Jesus did not say, whoever does the will of my Father will always be rewarded with a good parking place. <laughs> he didn't promise you that, even though many times we think we're supposed to get it because we prayed and Jesus, you know, we're in a hurry. Secondly, Jesus never said, if you lose your life for my sake, you're still always going to look good in your swimsuit when spring rolls around. <laughs> he did not promise that just because you love him, your diet's going to work and you're going to have a fabulous figure. Thirdly, Jesus did not say, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and you will not get a zit right before your wedding day or right before prom. He didn't promise you those kinds of things. The truth of the matter is, Jesus never said, God wants you to only have good days. He never promised us those kinds of things. 
in spite of what you may have heard really well-known preachers saying, Jesus never promised that you'd always be healthy, wealthy, in a season of favor. He never promised that your roof wouldn't leak and your plumbing wouldn't back up. He never promised that your Netflix movie wouldn't buffer right in the middle of your movie. <laughs> Guys, he never promised that your wife would never have a headache on a night when you're hot to trot. He never promised you those things. Reminds me of the guy who walked up to his wife out of the clear blue one evening and handed her two Tylenol, and she said, what's this for? And he said, it's for your headache. And she said, I don't have a headache. And he said, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Sorry, that had nothing to do with the message. <laughs> did, did see a couple of guys taking notes on that, though. John 16, let's get back on track. In John 16, Jesus is in the midst of a lengthy conversation a lengthy discourse with his disciples in fact five solid chapters of John come from this one conversation it happens on the night that Jesus is betrayed the night of the the last supper and John chapters 13 14 15 16 and 17 are all the words of Jesus to his disciples and then a prayer to the father on our behalf at the conclusion of this so it's Jesus final words of instruction and encouragement and help to his closest friends and in the course of that in these last minute instructions we're going to pick up in verse 20 of John 16 if you want to follow along in your outline it's there Jesus said I tell you for certain everybody say for certain that's a key phrase this isn't this might happen Th this could possibly come your way no I tell you for certain that you will cry and be sad but the world will be happy that's an uplifting thought. It's just the truth of the matter. To his closest friends, Jesus said, you are about to be incredibly sad. You're about to go through unspeakable pain and difficulty while the world around you is just having a grand old time. It's not going to be hard for them. It's going to be hard for you, and it's going to be hard for you because you follow me. And yes, for those guys, it's going to be intensely painful because they're going to watch him in the next few hours be arrested and brutalized, beaten, and within 24 hours, they're going to watch him be tortured and murdered. And so obviously, it's going to be very painful for them. But Jesus isn't just speaking about that moment, and he's not just speaking to those 11 guys. To his followers, he's speaking these words because this is a part of the reality of life. You're going to be sad, and the world will be happy. It's interesting that in this discourse, Jesus talks about the world, uses that phrase 19 times talks a lot about what we're going to experience and what the world is going to have to do with that here's some of the things he says about the world he says peace i give to you but not as the world gives he says the world hates you and the world hated me first he says you don't belong to the world and he prays father don't take them out of the world a lot of this is about the world system this isn't about jesus Hating the world, Jesus loves the world. God so loved the world that he sent Jesus into the world. But there is a system that is at cross purposes with God and what he's doing. And because it's at cross purposes with God and his kingdom, it's at cross purposes with us when we follow Christ. And so Jesus says, you're going to have a lot of pain and difficulty in this world because you don't belong to the world. And then he goes on to say, if you'll follow along, you'll cry and be sad, but the whole world will be happy. You will be sad, but then your sadness will change into happiness. When a woman gives birth to a baby, she has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the pain. She forgets because she is so happy that a child has been born into the world. Ladies, I just want to say as a disclaimer, I understand that we as men are never supposed to talk about the pain of childbirth because we know nothing about it. Guys, have you ever picked up on that? Like you try and talk about pain, and women always want to just trump that. You don't know anything about pain. You have not had a child. We get it. You're much tougher than us, and I'm not being sarcastic. We're sissies compared to you. That's why God lets you have babies. My wife is, a, is an RN, and she runs an IV clinic, so she sticks people all day long, and she observes constantly women are so much tougher than men. Men are the ones who are like, <gasps> you know, we, we can't handle pain. You all handle unspeakable pain in childbirth, and I'm acknowledging that, and I get that I don't understand, but I'm going to talk about it anyway because Jesus did, and he was a man. If he can, I'm going to. 
I've at least been in the room when it happened, and it was painful to watch. It was wonderful, but it was painful to watch. When you care about somebody and they're in that much pain, you hurt with them. I know you don't hurt as bad, but you do hurt. And it's sort of crazy to me how many times those of us who, when we're young and naive and you're first-time parents and you're drinking the Kool-Aid of just how wonderful natural childbirth is and don't use any drugs. Let me tell you, any of you women who hadn't had a baby yet, use the drugs. They offer you an epidural, ask for two. I mean, those are good things. Well, we were suckers the first time around. You know, the, all the stuff about the baby will be so much more alert those first few hours. Let them get a nap. They will be awake plenty when you go home. But that first time around, we drank the Kool-Aid, did, didn't do it the second time. The epidural was a gift from God. But that first time around, we got to witness childbirth in its natural form. It's scary to watch. Would not want to go through it. But the thing that stands out so much to me, more than the incredible stress and pain that filled that room, is how in one moment of time, when the baby just arrives, and I, and I still just remember how that first time it happened, what an overwhelming thing it was that I, it, it caught me off guard, that you go from feeling this incredible sense of anxiety, there's nothing but, but pain and tension in the room, to instantly tears of joy that you cannot hold back. I mean, if somebody held a gun to your head, you couldn't stop grinning and, and just weeping with joy because in that instant, all the pain is completely replaced with utter joy and happiness. Everybody that's ever watched a child be born knows what I'm talking about. It's just unforgettable. And Jesus says, you need to remember that because that's a picture of this bigger reality in life. As intense as the pain of childbirth can be, your life can be just as painful. It can, can't it? And it can last a lot longer than labor pains. And Jesus is saying, hold on. Because in the same way that horrible pain can suddenly be transformed into unspeakable happiness, that same thing can happen in your life. He goes on to say in verse 22, it is the same with you. Now you are sad, but I will see you again, and you will be happy. You will have a joy that no one can take away. That is a wonderful thought, isn't it? I'm going to give you a joy that circumstances, the world, hardship cannot take away from you. And then if we skip on down a few verses in the same chapter, Jesus goes on to say, I have told you these things so that you can have peace in me. Everybody say peace in me. It's an important line. You can have peace in me. In this world, you will have troubles. But be brave, I have defeated the world. As we learn to, to truly just live life, whatever's going on, whatever we're being called on to do, to just live life in the presence of Jesus, which is not as hard as it sounds. When we learn to experience and recognize the presence of Jesus in whatever we're going through, when we learn to dwell in his presence, we can have peace and joy even in the middle of the chaos. But in the middle of some, some really confusing mixed messages that we get from other Christians and from Christian leadership many times, we need to remind ourselves of what Jesus did and did not say about what's going on around us, that Jesus never says, you'll always have good days, you'll always win, you'll always get the job, you'll always get the promotion, you'll always get accepted, you'll get the scholarship, the sun will always be in your face, the wind will always be at your back. He never said these things. God never promised that. What he does say is, you will have pain and trouble. That's a promise. You're going to hurt. You're going to struggle. Welcome to Freedom Church, where we're all about building you up this morning. <laughs> it is. It's a guarantee in life. So don't buy the, the garbage that when you love Jesus and you trust him, life's just always going to be smooth because it will mess with your head if you believe that. Just because you follow Jesus doesn't mean that you'll have a pain-free life. 
There will be seasons of blessing, abundance, favor that are just so much better than we deserve. And then there'll be seasons where it feels like hardship is a set of big waves that just come crashing one after another on top of us. Have you ever noticed when, you, when you're out in the Gulf, you ever noticed how waves will do that? You'll, you'll go through a, a lengthy period that there won't be a single big wave come along. And then out of nowhere, there'll be three or four or five consecutive waves that are just killers. They're, they're just huge. And life tends to be that way. You'll go through these extended seasons. Of it's just rocking along so well. And then it seems like when hardship hits, it always comes in twos, threes, fours, or fives. That It'll be several big waves that, that hit one after the other. And the truth of the matter is, across this room and across the, those of you who are watching and listening online, there are some that you're in that wonderful in-between season of just pretty smooth sailing. But some of you are right in the middle of a season where a number of big waves are hitting. There are some of you right now, if you're honest, you're in a season where you feel so abandoned, so neglected, so alone. No matter where you are, in a room like this with a bunch of other good people, people who would love to, to help you, but right now you feel very much alone. There are some of you for whom depression is a major part of life right now. And no matter who you talk to or what you take, it is just a constant battle. Or you're in a, a season right now where it's really deep and thick and it is impossible to snap out. Some of you are in the middle of a really difficult season relationally where it seems like no matter what you try, the harder you try, the more friction and stress there is. And nothing feels right in life when the most important relationship is, is out of whack. Some of you are in a season, for some a very lengthy season, where one or more of your kids are acting out in ways that are breaking your heart. If you say left, they go right. If you say right, they go left. They're not listening to you, and some have cut you off. For some, your kids don't want anything to do with you at all, and others, they still have contact with you, but only to take advantage of you, and it is breaking your heart. That's a hard season to be in. Some right now are facing, fa facing real health issues, and, and there are major questions and obstacles there, and it is not clear at all how this is going to play out. That's just the reality of your life right now. I mean, we could go on and on. There's some really heavy stuff being faced in this room. And just cleaning up and putting on a happy face and singing Jesus songs doesn't take the pain away, does it? I mean, it can help us to forget for a few minutes, but then you walk out of this place and you're still facing a very, very difficult reality. And it really is tempting for us to, to ask some hard, hard questions. And it's okay for us to ask hard questions. Like, where is God in the middle of this? And why is it that when I've asked for relief, when I've asked God to fix this or take it away, why is it that that has not happened? Is it because my faith is too weak or because God doesn't care? Or is he even there? Is he listening? Is he really as good as they say? I mean, you understand with some real hardships in life, why people would ask these kinds of questions. And yet Jesus warned us on the front end that pain and trouble are coming. If it's not just acknowledged, if it's actually a part of the plan, there's got to be a purpose for it, doesn't, doesn't there? I mean, surely God must have a plan for why he would allow us to go through the things that we're going through. And the truth of the matter is that he does. I don't want to be really clear on this point. The fact that God has a plan and that he'll use our pain, suffering, and hardships redemptively doesn't mean that he causes them. Do you follow me on that? There's a big difference between God taking bad things that happen and working them in a way that good things come out of it. big difference between that and saying, oh yeah, God made that happen. God caused that death. He caused that sickness. He caused that loss because he wants to punish you. That's messed up. That's not the God revealed in Scripture. 
But the good God that we find in the scripture, the good God who made us and who, who sustains us and who does allow some really unspeakable things sometimes to happen in and around us, that God does have a plan for what he wants to do in the middle of our trials, pain, and hardship. So I want to just take a few minutes to talk to you about two things that you can count on that God is doing when we're moving through a season of pain, difficulty, or hardships. The first thing that it does is it proves your faith. And you may go, well, big deal. I wasn't out to prove anything. No, it, it proves your faith not to God. God knows your heart. God knows all about your faith and my faith in advance. But when we go through hard seasons, it proves our faith to us and to those around us. And when we say it proves it, it reveals it. And it strengthens it. And it, it has the opportunity to either strengthen or to break us. Somebody said to me recently, Christians are like tea bags. You never know how strong they are until you put them in really hot water. It's true, isn't it? I mean, it's easy to talk the God talk if you grew up in church. I mean, how easy is it to just be... Praise the Lord. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. It's easy to say that stuff when you're healthy and your kids are healthy and there's enough money in the bank to pay all the bills and there's a plan and there's a job. Anybody can say that stuff in a season like that. But what are you saying when most of those things have been removed from your life? Is God still just as good? Is, is God still just as as loved by you in those seasons because those are the seasons that really will prove your faith and they will expose either the depth of your faith or the absence of true faith. Peter, the one of Jesus, apparently one of his two closest friends here on earth, in an incredibly difficult and painful time in history, somewhere between 60 and 65 AD, this is a a time when Nero is on the throne over the Roman Empire. And he was about as wicked as a ruler can be. I mean, you picture anybody in the last hundred years that, that we think of as, as the most wicked tyrants on earth. He probably trumps all of them that we've known in the last century. I mean, this is the guy who for his own entertainment, he would have Christians brought in and animals butchered, slaughtered, and skinned. And then he would have those bloody, fresh animal skins wrapped around the Christians and sewn onto them. And then they would be put in a ring and wild, hungry dogs put in there with them so that they would you know, smell the blood of those skins and devour the Christians alive and watch that for entertainment. Nero would throw parties where he would have Christians brought in and tied to poles and to trees, and then would have massive amounts of hot melted wax poured over them. And then they would be lit on fire as human candles, and he would have a party where people would, would drink and revel at the sound of Christians screaming in torment as they died. Against that backdrop, Peter writes to those who are facing the those kinds of dangers, those kinds of fears. And he says in 1 Peter 1, verse 6, so be truly glad. Okay, he's not a sadist. He's not trying to say, it's awesome when you suffer. No, he says, so be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. This is the key line. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. I'll say that line again. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. That's an encouraging word, and yet I'll just tell you that for me as a pastor, it is a very sobering and, and almost disturbing word because the talk about proving that faith is genuine certainly does suggest that if there is genuine faith, that there is also faith that isn't the real deal, that isn't genuine. And it scares me so much that in, particularly in American culture where Christianity has become so much of the fabric of our culture, 
I think there's a great risk that many of us would, would get enough of church, enough of Christianity, that we would learn to speak the language of faith. That we'd go to church, that we'd say prayers, that we'd read our Bibles, and still have the potential of not possessing a real living faith in, in the true God. That's a, that's a very scary thought to me. I had the opportunity a week and a half ago to sit across the table from a friend who was going through a season like what I was just describing a few minutes ago. And he asked me a question that on the surface doesn't sound like a hard question, and yet I knew it had unusual depth to it. The question was just this. He said, do you know what faith is? Now, on the surface of it, I've been a pastor for a long time. I've studied theology for years in graduate school. I, I know all kinds of definitions of faith. I can give you meaningful definitions of faith. So it seems like an easy question. Do you know what faith is? But I knew because of what this friend is going through that none of those definitions probably measured up to what faith had become in his life. And I, I said, I think I do. But I just kind of left it hanging because I really wanted to hear his heart on the matter. And he said, you know, for most of my, my life, I've thought that I, I knew what faith was too. But faith has, has come to mean something very different to me now. And then he shared what faith means for him now. And I, I want to share that with you with, with his permission. He said, what faith means for me now is, and he, and he began to describe a picture. He said, faith for me now is me standing on a very high cliff and looking down and knowing that I don't want to fall over and go down there, but realizing that the ground that I'm standing on is now beginning to move and shake and crack and give way. And I'm, I'm praying, oh God, whatever happens, just don't let the, the rocks that I'm standing on, don't let the, ro the, the ground that I'm standing on give way beneath my feet, but it does anyway. And in that moment, I realized there's a rope hanging next to me, and I grab hold of the rope. And now I'm hanging there because the ground has just been swept from beneath my feet, and I'm clinging to the rope, and I'm saying, Oh, God, whatever happens, just don't let the rope break. Just make this rope, this rope stay secure. But even as I'm saying that, I, I feel that it's beginning to give, and I look up, and I can see that strand by strand, the, the rope is beginning to give way, and I'm, I'm just praying, Oh, God, don't let it break. And he said, As I continue to watch, I realize it's down to just one or two strands one or two little fibers holding on, and I'm saying, oh, God, don't let those give way, and they give way. And there's no longer any rope, and there's no longer any ground, and there's nothing left that I can hold on to but to just cry out to God to do the impossible. And he said, I realized that in my life, I had trusted in what I could see and put my feet on and what I could see and put my hands on, and I'm in a place in life now where I don't have any of those things anymore. And all I can do is trust that somehow God is still going to hold me up. Now that can sound like, you know, wonderful talk that doesn't mean anything from some people's lips. But from my friend's lips, that meant a great deal. Because I want to tell you what, some of what he's gone through in the last couple of years. A little less than two years ago, he got a phone call early in the morning where he was asked the question, do you know where your son is? He didn't come home last night. And he said, I knew from the moment that I got that phone call that my life was going to change forever. Within a few hours, they found out that his son had been tragically killed in an accident on a motorcycle. Now, we experience a lot of different pains in life. I don't know that there's ever a pain that we experience that matches the loss of a child. We all experience the pain of losing people. My friend made the point, he said, you know, honestly, one of the hardest things to hear people say is when people will say to you, oh, I know exactly how you feel because I lost my mama or I lost my daddy at some point. And he said, I, I, you know, I've been through burying a parent before, and it's terrible. It's, it's awful pain. It's, it's difficult to walk through. But he said, i got to tell you, it, it pales in comparison 
to losing a child. It's a completely different deal. We, we go through life expecting to bury our parents. We, we dread it. We don't want to think about it. But we expect to bury our parents. We figure it's a 50-50. We're going to bury our spouses. But we don't expect to bury our kids. He had to walk through that, losing a son that he was very close to. In the same year, his sister that he was very close to had just walked back into her apartment when a neighbor in the apartment complex from just across the parking lot got in his vehicle and went to pull out and had a seizure, causing him to mash the gas to the floor, and his vehicle sped across the parking lot and crashed through her apartment, ran over her, and killed her on the spot. The same year, a son and a sister, both of whom he was very close to, and as if those two losses are not enough, sandwiched in there in the midst of all of that in that unspeakable year. He was diagnosed with a very serious form of cancer that immediately cost him his kidney and has put him in a situation where he's in an ongoing battle with cancer and having to continue to go back again and again to Houston for cancer treatments. Now, I know how our minds work. And for some people hearing that story, we've been so jacked up in our thinking that we immediately begin to think, yeah, I wonder what he did to deserve all that. I wonder what he did that brought all that on in his life, that God would punish him that way. Can I offer an answer to you? He's loved and served the Lord for most of his life. He's pastored for more than 30 years. He's lived an upright life life that's exemplary and still he's facing great loss and battling serious illness the friend that I'm talking about isn't some ad- imaginary person out there just to make a good sermon illustration the story that I share comes from right here in our church because the friend that I'm talking about is one of our own it's it's my friend David seated in the room right now who's who's walking through this and, and still living this reality. And David, I'll say to you that I appreciate the example of a faith that has been tested. He said this about where life has taken him and what fi- faith has come to mean to him. He said that point when there's no ground left beneath your feet and there's no rope left to hang on to, He said, what that looks like for me is that there have been plenty of mornings that if God isn't real and if God doesn't come through for me that day, I can't get out of bed. I can't put my foot on the floor. I can't take the next step unless God just shows up because there isn't a rope to pull me up. There isn't any ground left to stand on. There's nothing left but God. Nobody wants to sign up for that experience. I get it. None of us want to walk through that kind of pain, but I promise you this, God doesn't waste that kind of pain. God refines a faith and exposes a faith that is so real that when it looks like you don't have anything left to hold on to, but God, and what's exposed is a deep faith in God and the reality of a God who is there. You can't see him, but he's so real through those times. And what we learn is that that kind of faith that has been tested is a faith that can be trusted. So many times we go through our own trials and we're tempted to say, well, my migraines won't go away or my my back pain won't go away no matter how many times I've prayed. God must not be real. I've been in this bind financially for so long and I've prayed for a breakthrough and it's never happened and I'm still in a bind. God must not love me. You know, when we do that, I think we're we're the living examples of what Jesus talked about when he told the parable of the, the different soils and the sower and the seeds. Do you remember that parable? And he said some of the seed fell on rocky, shallow soil. And he said the seeds immediately sprang up and they looked like plants that were going to bear good fruit. But then what happened? He said the sun came up and it got really hot. 
And in the midst of, of the hottest day, those plants that look so real, they're a picture of faith that looks so real in good times. Oh, we're praising Jesus, loving God all the time. God is good. And then the heat comes. And the loss comes. And it's no longer a pep rally for Jesus. And Jesus said, the heat reveals what's really going on. And he said, for some, what's going to be revealed is that there's no depth. And they're scorched. And suddenly they wither and die. That is a picture of faith that has been exposed to be shallow and not genuine. There's no condemnation in what I'm saying. It is a gift from God to expose a faith that is not real and to bring us to a place where all the pretense of religion and Jesus' pep rallies that don't have substance behind them get exposed so that we find out what is real and what is not in our lives, and that's a gift from God. Can we just get really honest about this? I don't think there's anybody in this room that cares anything for pretend religion anymore. I mean, are you not just sick to death of that? Don't you just feel like you grew up in enough of that? Don't you know that that just makes God want to gag at times? All of the, the pretense, as miserable as it is to go through difficult seasons, the beauty of what emerges is people who are real and whose faith is real, and they may not be just filled with all these wonderful, trite little, little isms and lines that, that come out of religious people's mouths, but what remains is so intensely real. And it's a little bit scary to be around them when you are that shallow Christian of pretense. When we want to just hear in response to, hey, how are you doing today? Blessed and highly favored. Okay. I, listen, I've said that plenty of times in my life. There's nothing wrong with that line. Unless it's just become a rote response, like pulling the string on the doll. I appreciate being around some people who have walked through the fire. Maybe they're in the fire now. And when you say, how are you doing, that sometimes they look you back in the eye and go, do you really want to know? <laughs> and not every moment do we need to be that real with each other. Sometimes it's okay to say, you know, I'm pressing on through. I'm trusting in the goodness of God or whatever. But there's something really neat about getting to that place that this other stuff is stripped away and what we get is real faith and real life with each other. The first thing that trials and pain and hardships will do is prove our faith. The second thing that they do, and this is good, is that they prepare you for what God has planned. They pr prepare you for what is up next, for what is further down the line. So don't you just assume in the middle of, of the chaos and the pain that, that this is a pointless defeat or tragedy because God is using what you're going through to prepare you for the assignment that you have further down the line. Count on that. Ease and comfort never make you stronger, do they? Safety never makes you braver. Living in a safe place never makes you a more courageous person. Living in a comfortable place never makes you a stronger person. That's why we pay money and invest the time to go to the gym and make ourselves hurt. I can't tell you how many times I've walked out of the gym and said, I can't believe we paid money to do this. I hated every minute of it. But why do we do it? Because we get it. You can't get stronger. You can't get better. You can't get healthier without some resistance, without some pain. James understood this. That's why he wrote in James 1, Dear brothers and sisters, he's not, gonna, he's not condescending. He's not talking down to anyone. He is talking as a brother to us. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. It's just an opportunity for great joy. It, it's also an opportunity for bitterness. It's an opportunity for you to be sour. It's an opportunity for you to be negative for the rest of your life. But it's also the very same circumstance is an opportunity for you to begin to experience great joy. And it's up to you what the outcome is going to be. 
For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. That, that word endurance has just captured my attention. Jackie and I have got some newer friends who are endurance athletes. And what that means, that sounds really cool. And then when you realize what that means, it doesn't sound cool at all. That They run distances that I don't like to drive. <laughs> I mean, we were out to dinner with them the other night. And they're like, yeah, he had to get in his 17-mile run today. I'm like, 17 miles? I don't want to drive 17 miles today. I don't. They, they, do, they run marathons and do these Ironman things. They swim and bike and run distances that are just crazy they're endurance athletes but they have they have been through the pain for so long that they can endure things that I don't even want to do in a car much less on foot or in the water and James said the testing of your faith makes you a spiritual endurance athlete that you can do what hardly anybody else can do when your faith has been tested. So you see it as an opportunity for God to make of you a spiritual super athlete. That if you're walking through great pain, great difficulty, he's preparing you for great significant opportunities in the future where it's going to require a super endurance athlete. I really do worry about what I've watched happen in our culture during my lifetime, and I'm a part of it. I'm, I'm saying this confessionally. I'm not talking down to anybody. I'm just I'm confessing what I've watched. For those of you who are a part of, of the same generation as me, I'm, I'm really early 50s, <laughs> really early, young 50s. But those of you in my generation, I think we screwed something up badly when we were raising our kids. And I'm not bashing our kids when I say this. It's just an observation about something that we've done. My generation obsessed about the safety of our children. We obsessed over the comfort of our children at a level that I don't think the world's ever seen before. Not from like just across all kinds of socioeconomic and ethnic lines. I mean... We've just gone bonkers about making sure that our kids don't have to endure any kind of hardship, any kind of pain, any kind of trial. And for fear that they might, we make sure they never have to work for anything, that they never really have to truly pay for anything. We don't dare let anyone else correct our children, punish our children, because we wouldn't want them to suffer pain or hardship we're helicopter parents we run in and rescue them from whatever they're going through and the net result of that in the life of any human being is typically that we will grow up to be entitled spoiled brats it scares me to think what will emerge if we prevent a generation from ever having to face hardship or pain God is the best father that there's ever been. And he is a father who recognizes the value of hardship, the value of struggle, even the value of pain. That you have to learn to press through pain and still do the right thing. Okay, I confess I'm chasing a rabbit, rabbit here, but I do think we should have to wrestle with this. If hardships... If real difficulties and struggles are supposed to be a part of a life from God's design, can it possibly be right for us as parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles to try and insulate our kids from every difficult or painful experience that they ever go through? And, and trust me, I'm not offended or shocked that there's not a lot of amen going on as I talk about this. We're probably doing a lot more oh me than amen right now. I, I parented through through this period too and it just it it worries me that we may have missed something critically important here because we've parented just like some of these sports leagues that have been created in the same time frame that I think are the epitome of what I'm talking about 
where you're not allowed to keep score in the kids' games because everyone's a winner. Grow up and face the world and tell me how that works out for you. Is that life as you experience it in the world? The last time I checked, one person got the job and 10 got rejected. That they didn't say, well, since 11 people applied, you all get the job, but only one of you is going to get paid. But feel good because you all got the job. That's, that's just not real life. Rejection and hardship is okay. I think about my own life and I realize it's not the compliments it's not the encouragement, it's not the praise that I've ever received at any points along the way that prepared me for the hard seasons. It hasn't been safety or security that's prepared me for the, the challenges that lay further down the line. It's been the surprises. It's been the unseen things. I was just thinking back on my life this week and remembering how when I was 19 years old, I used to, during my teenage years, I would spend my entire summers working at a Christian youth camp. It was really important stuff that God used to shape my life but when I was 19 some really bizarre stuff happened that summer and the guy who was in charge the guy that we all served under some things went really haywire in his life and I just happened that year to be the most experienced member of the team serving under him I did not sign up for this but God ended up positioning me to have to speak to some very uncomfortable things in his life miserable experience that I hated and and I'm thinking what I don't want to be here I don't want to be talking about these things with this person and yet he at this point now is just calling me again and again to talk through things that I'm like I'm as green as a gourd I, you know I don't want to be the person talking about these very grown-up things with you and the next thing I know when Monday morning rolls around he's resigned and gone without another word and the board of directors who were not present contact me and say, you're all we've got in terms of experience. Would you be willing to just run things for the rest of the summer? There's a staff of 17, 17 people, and tons of kids coming in every week. And I'm like, did you remember I'm 19? I'm going back for my sophomore year of college here in a few weeks. It did not go as smooth as silk. It was, it was wonderful. There, was a, uh, there were a lot of God moments and a lot of life change. But it's kind of freaking me out going through this. I didn't sign up for that. And yet I look back on it and I think that was the one, of one of the most important formative seasons in my life in preparing me for ministry for years to come. Didn't ask for it. It was really hard. Would never want to repeat it. And yet it was one of the most important seasons in my life. I think about in the years that followed as I was finishing college and going through four and a half years of graduate school and the number of times that churches some of them really significant churches and wonderful ministry opportunities reached out and contacted me pastors in different churches about being you know an associate pastor or a senior pastor in different places and and I'd get so fired up about oh man that'd be a great you know first opportunity in ministry and every single time got passed over on every one of them I don't care who you are. Oh, that hurts. You just spend weeks just dreaming about and getting your heart and head wrapped around something every single time to be turned down. Got into divinity school, spent four and a half years in divinity school, and almost every one of my peers in divinity school were serving churches, most of them as senior pastors or worship leaders, some as associate pastors in large churches. Honestly, to my recollection, I am the only person that I can remember in divinity school in the position that I was in. I had served two churches as janitor of both. I mean, I can remember being in, you have to do an internship class for two years called Supervised Experience in Ministry. And I remember the experienced pastor, professor who's leading the class, and you, you have to write up your, your ministry experience for each week, if different encounters that you have where you feel like God was at work. And one of the encounters that I had written up was a, a neat chance to minister to one of the other janitors of the church that I served, who was not a church-going person, was going through a hard time. And so I had done what we were supposed to do. I'd written up that encounter and all that went on there. And so this professor, as we're having to share our reports, he's just like, 
He's loving my report that week. It's like the, the best feedback that I got. But, but here's the wonderful irony in this. He's like, this is just, this is so awesome. You actually took time and sat down and talked with and shared with one of the, the janitors in your church. I'm like, dude, I am one of the janitors in my church. You're thinking I'm reaching so low. I'm just reaching out to my bro. I'm a janitor. I can laugh about it at 51, but it wasn't so, wasn't so funny at 24. But God uses those things. I mean, it's very clear that God lovingly was saying, you are not ready to lead because you haven't learned to serve. And so we'll just keep you enrolled in this class as long as we need to so that you learn to serve so that you're equipped to lead later on. I am so glad. I mean, he had to re-enroll me in that class. I thought after janitorial 101, that was the end, that you get promoted to youth pastor 201. No, it was like you flunked janitor 101, so we're going to have a repeat of it. I wouldn't trade that for anything. I think about later on when I was a full-time person in ministry and I was a student pastor and... Um, what for me had been maybe the most meaningful thing that I had been a part of, that I had actually been able to invest myself in. It was a situation that had freaked me out going into it because it was, it was such a heavy experience. A very young couple. They were not churched. It was a messy situation. It was just somebody knew of them and asked if I would go to the hospital and be with them because they had a critically ill child. And by the time that I got there, their child had died. And I'm green. I'm like, I'm the janitor. Just got, you know, it's, it's what you're thinking when you're in that experience. It's like, I think I should call the senior pastor for this, but didn't get to. And God used that whole thing. It was, it was so painful to watch and be a part of, of that whole ordeal of, of being there with him as they go in to say goodbye to their child for the last time and all of that. It was so much pain. And yet, out of that, the mother came to faith in Christ. The father returned to the Lord. The grandmother became a new believer. And in fact, when we planted church on the eastern shore, the grandmother was the first person I ever baptized. But church on the eastern shore didn't exist yet at that point in time. And so, as this family is experiencing terrible pain but wonderful redemption they get in the church they start recognizing all these things that need to change and and they're like we, we want to be baptized and we would like to be married and they're I mean they're really doing the right stuff but they've come from a messy situation and among the things that were considered to be messy is that she was white and he was black I'm thinking, this is just fantastic. God's working in this family, and who cares what color anybody is? What difference does it make? And I thought everybody around me is celebrating the same thing I'm celebrating until I get blindsided in a church meeting by the deacon leadership and called out, oh, I'll never forget the phrase, for lowering the high standards of our church with these people expecting that our church would baptize them. And part of me is, like you are in this moment, appalled at that thought, and yet there's a part of me that's going, but there's some righteous people in this room that are going to rise up and say, how dare you degrade the message and ministry of the kingdom in such a way? And nobody does. Nobody stands up to speak out against that. And I'm like, I'm going to, but you realize you're on an island. No joy in that. No fun in that. But I want to tell you, it's not the attaboys that you get at the door if it's been a good day in church. And, and I, listen, I don't mean to belittle that. It's, it's always great for us to give each other encouragement. But the attaboys are not what prepare you for what's ahead. It's seasons like that 
when you feel like you've done the right thing and you've been spit in the face for doing it, those are the moments that you part of you wants to quit, part of you wants to to fight back, part of you wants to give up, but God's going, no, we're going to use this to prepare you for what's ahead because I've got more planned. I've got bigger assignments, and we've got to take you through some hard seasons to get you ready for what's ahead. You could share stories, many of you, from your lives that would make my little stories pale by comparison. But God is letting all of us go through some hard seasons, and he's not wasting those things. He's getting us ready because he has planned what is ahead. These aren't random events. The hard truth is God's preparation often comes packaged as pain. They didn't tell you that in Sunday school, did they? God's preparation for future assignments often comes packaged as pain. I mean, think about it. How did God prepare Joseph to rule in Egypt? Well, the story is really clear. By being rejected by his brothers, sold as a slave, having to serve as a slave, being accused of rape that he didn't commit, serving time in prison for a crime that he didn't commit, and instead of being broken down by all of those things, his faith is growing deeper. His faith is getting stronger as the ground is disappearing beneath his feet and the rope that he's trying to hold onto is snapping. His faith in God is growing. Could it be that your current pain is God's way of preparing you for his next major assignment in your life. So the next time that you're turned down, don't see it as just being turned down. You just realize God is toughening me up. God is preparing me. The good news of the gospel has never been the promise that now that you've got Jesus, he's going to save you from all of those bad things. No, the good news is Jesus is going to save you from all of your sins. He's going to see that those are all forgiven, and he's going to be with you through all of your pains and trials. Not that he's going to deliver you from all of those things. He never promised that your girlfriend would never leave you, that you'd never lose your job, that you'd never have to replace your roof, or that your vehicle would never be wrecked truth of the matter is following Jesus is not a gimmick for getting what you want on this earth in first John 5 God through his servant John the beloved said this everyone who is a child of God has the power to win against the world that's good news it is our faith that has won the victory against the world so who wins against the world Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. What is it that wins in spite of all that the world throws at you? It is a personal, simple faith in the crucified and risen Son of God. It is not a faith that we figured out how Jesus is going to fix it all or make it all work out. It is a trust in the fact that Jesus is who he said he is, that he is good, and that we can trust him no matter what. And that Jesus said, back to John 16, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I don't know what you're facing, but I am sure of this. That there are some people in the room, some of you watching and listening online right now, the thought of pain, hardship, and trials is not just some theoretical concept. It is very real in your life. God may not have caused it. There's a good chance he didn't. But he sure doesn't want to waste it. And I have a feeling that the voice of the Holy Spirit may be saying to some of us today, the enemy tricked you and convinced you that your hurt, your difficulty is some kind of evidence that God doesn't care or that he doesn't love you or that your prayers have been ignored. And none of those are true. God's been doing a work in you through all of that. He's creating an endurance spiritual athlete out of you. He's developing a faith in you that's going to be needed in some opportunities that he's going to give ahead that you haven't dreamed of yet. But God sees them clearly. 
And he knew you're going to have to walk through some fire and some deep water to be prepared for what's ahead. And that doesn't mean you should be scared about what's ahead. You're going to be prepared for what's ahead. You're going to be able to walk in victory. But you're going to have to choose to trust in Jesus through the difficult times. So I'm going to invite you to join me now as we turn to him together in prayer. I really want to invite you more than anything that I could say that you would follow along with in prayer. I want to invite you to just take a moment to just be honest and real with God in where you are right now. Maybe you're in that season between the big waves. It's just been smooth, a season of favor and blessing. And if that's where you are, please pause and just give thanks to God for that. It's always so sweet to be in those times. And for those of you that you're in the season where the waves are getting big, where there's a lot of unknowns or a lot of pain or opposition, would you just be honest with God about that? And I want to just invite you to make a response of faith in the middle of that and to say, God, in spite of what I'm facing, in spite of maybe some uncertainty about what's ahead, I just choose to trust you. I don't know the outcomes, but I do believe that I know your heart, that you are good and that you love me. And so, God, I today just reaffirm my faith in you. I trust you with my health. I trust you with my family, with my finances, with my future. And if I need to make adjustments, I trust you to show me that. I open my heart up to that. God, you are good even when life is not. We trust you in good times and we trust you in hard times. And today, in ways that are just very personal, we offer ourselves to you again and we pray that simple prayer, have your way in us. Would you do what only you can do, O God? to bind up hurting hearts today. Would you make yourself known in ways that are very real to us? We welcome the work and the voice of your Holy Spirit among us, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. 